The church means many things to many people. I'd like to speak with you about the Christian church, of which I'm a member. Perhaps you've met someone who, when asked what church he belonged to, replied, Christian. But when asked, but what denomination? I said, no denomination, just Christian. There's a growing group of people in this world today who prefer to call themselves Christians only. We're going to examine this movement, find out why there are in the world of this century People who want to simply be known as followers of Christ, or disciples, or Christians, members of the Christian church, or the Church of Christ. Of course, there's no better place to begin this story than right here in Jerusalem, for it is here that Jesus established His church. It's rewarding to stand in the streets of Jerusalem and sense the history of scenes which look much the same now as it did 2,000 years ago when Jesus walked here the little town of Bethlehem where he was born, the sheep roaming the rocky hills where he played as a boy, the wilderness where he withstood the temptations of Satan, the Jericho Road, hot and dusty, which often he traveled, the village of Cana where he performed his first miracle, cool Galilee near his home on whose shores he preached and fed the multitudes with loaves and fishes, and where he called his first apostles, the fishermen, Peter, Andrew, James, and John. Bethany, home of his friends, Mary and Martha, and Lazarus. The Mount of Olives, where he wept over Jerusalem. Gethsemane, where he prayed alone. Golgotha, the place of the skull, where he was crucified. The garden tomb, where he rose from the dead. All these remind us of the reality of Jesus Christ, by whose name we are called. From Jerusalem, he commissioned his apostles to go and make disciples, baptizing them, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, Matthew 28, 19 and 20. And the Spirit of God came upon men as a whirlwind and began to move across the world in the form of the church. Paul, who once had persecuted the church, obeyed the gospel and carried its message to other places. To Damascus, where facing danger from those who now would persecute him, he made his escape through a barricaded window in the wall of the fortified city. He traveled throughout Asia Minor, spreading the gospel and building up the church in such important cities as Corinth and Athens, where he answered the philosophers on Mars Hill in the shadow of the symbol of culture the famous Acropolis. Then in Caesarea, Paul was in prison, but he continued to win men through the gospel. And finally, though in custody, he was able to realize the longing of his heart to go across the Mediterranean to Rome, capital of the mighty empire, which extended over Europe. Now Christianity had become a threat to Rome. And as they tried in Palestine to silence Jesus, so they now launched a campaign to silence his followers. Then came an ugly period of persecution. Christians were hunted down, and in the catacombs beneath the city they were allowed to bury their dead. Many were captured and sentenced to die before the emperor and the crowds in the Roman arenas. The spectacle of throwing Christians to the lions was preferred over the fights of the Roman gladiators. But despite this fierce persecution, Rome could not stamp out Christianity. 
and history testifies that the blood of the martyrs was the seed of the church. But then strangely, the church became politically powerful. The simple church of Jesus gradually developed into a hierarchy with trappings of the most elegant sort. His commands and teachings were all but obscured by non-biblical traditions and practices. There were those who raised their voices against these distortions, but the would-be reformers were branded heretics. The movement for reformation became a great force, but men, being convinced of one leader or another, divided into groups and denominations until today in America, there are over 500 of them. But something happened in America 150 years ago that caused the beginning of what is called the Restoration Movement. There was born in the hearts of men a desire to restore simple, original Christianity before the introduction of man-made creeds and regulations. Early stirrings of the movement were felt in England and Scotland, Ireland and Wales. But it was in America, shortly after the Revolutionary War, that it began to catch fire. In this new country, without hundreds of years of traditions, it seemed that it might be possible for Christian men and women to unite in simple New Testament Christianity. And across the new frontiers, this movement began to form. In Kentucky in 1801, there occurred at Cane Ridge one of the great phenomena which characterized this period. Barton Stone, a Presbyterian minister, together with some other preachers, had arrived at the remote settlement to hold services and serve communion. To their surprise, they found 750 wagon loads of people waiting for them. No one knows where they came from. The largest city in Kentucky had only 1,700 people at the time. But the crowds became so large that no one man could be heard by all. So other ministers began to preach, as many as six at a time in various parts of the area. Estimates of the crowd range from 3,000 to 25,000 in one day. Those who came stayed for days until the surrounding countryside had been exhausted of food. The records are not clear, but one thing is certain. The Spirit of God united these thousands of people in a common spiritual need, and it seemed that God was visiting the American frontier people in a special way. From the time of Cane Ridge on, Barton Stone developed the growing conviction that man-made creeds and confessions tended to divide Christians. So he and others, who numbered about 15,000, dissolved their presbytery and united in an association which called itself simply Christian. At about the same time in western Pennsylvania, Thomas Campbell, a seceder Presbyterian who had come to America from Ireland, was disciplined by his presbytery for administering communion to those who were not of his group. Thomas Campbell felt that closed communion was wrong, that the scriptures clearly taught that this was the Lord's table and no man had the right to deny it to another Christian. When his denomination declined to assign him a pulpit, he and others formed a group that was called the Christian Association of Washington, Pennsylvania. He was commissioned by the association to write its aims and purposes. And while living in the farmhouse of Addison Welsh, waiting for his family to join him from Europe, Thomas Campbell wrote his declaration and address, one of the most remarkable documents of American religious history. In it, he stressed the need for Christian unity, and the aims of the movement from that time on were summarized in the phrase, in faith, unity, in opinions, liberty, in all things, love. When his son Alexander arrived from the university in Scotland, he found that though they had been separated by an ocean, they had each come to the same conclusion. The authority of scriptures had to surpass any man-made creed or tradition. After studying the scriptures pertaining to baptism, Alexander became convinced that he should be immersed. To make the position clear, a sequence of sermons lasting a total of seven hours was preached. Then the immersion took place in the deep pool of a branch of the Buffalo Creek. His father was not so easily persuaded, but on the day of his son's baptism, he quietly revealed that he had asked his wife to prepare a change of clothing for him too. Alexander was a disciplined scholar and writer, and soon emerged as the leader of the growing group of Christians. During his lifetime, he wrote 59 books and was the editor of two monthly periodicals. He spent hours in his study, a small brick building in the shape of a hexagon, a few steps from his house. 
It had windows only at the tip, which besides giving good light to work by, reminded him, as he put it, of his need for light from above. In his home, which was known for many miles around as the Campbell Mansion because it was the first house west of the Alleghenies with glass windows, he founded a boys' academy, and his interest in education led him to found a college across the creek in what is now Bethany, West Virginia. Eventually, the movement encouraged the founding of many schools and colleges across the country. Bethany's first buildings were modeled after those of Glasgow University, the Campbell's alma mater. In 1832, the movement of the Campbell's and that of Barton Stone united. Other frontier preachers such as Raccoon John Smith and Walter Scott became part of the common cause, restoring the Bible as the only rule of faith and practice. They became known as Christians or disciples, and from this humble beginning in the Ohio Valley, the movement has grown in 130 years to now include over five million believers. The men and women of this movement came from churches and groups with wide theological backgrounds, but they came together because they felt that the seed of truth and the basis for unity could be found in the New Testament. The emphasis of this plea for unity has always marked our movement, for as Christ prayed in John 17, 20 and 21, My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. We believe it was because of this that ours was the only American church which did not divide over the slavery issue during the Civil War. A century later, we still have no written creed, no declaration of faith, except what the Bible says. And considering all the commandments of Jesus, we believe we must obey them. For example, in the matter of baptism, we believe that it is necessary for a believer to be baptized as a part of God's provision for salvation. Jesus said, except a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. The apostles preached that men should repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. We believe also that baptism is for those who are old enough to make a confession of their own faith in Christ as Savior. For this reason, we do not practice infant baptism. Baptism, according to the New Testament, must be preceded by faith and repentance. Jesus was about 30 years old when he submitted himself to John's baptism, as the scripture says, to fulfill all righteousness. It was all inspiring to visit the spot where Jesus went down into the Jordan River to be baptized. This act of baptism was not a discreet wetting of one's brow in a secluded corner of the church. It took all of oneself into the water in the plain view of any who wanted to watch to visibly, openly, and unconditionally declare that he was giving himself completely into the hands of God. Something happens at baptism. Paul says, we were buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life, Romans 6, 4. In the matter of communion, the Lord's Supper was instituted by Jesus as a memorial of His death when He said, This do in remembrance of Me. The early Christians did so each Lord's Day as they met to worship, as we read in Acts 20, verse 7, And on the first day of the week, the disciples came together to break bread. We believe that we need the blessing of this communion with Christ every bit as much as the early church and Christ invites all who belong to Him to partake. On matters where there is no decisive position in the Scripture, we believe that each Christian should have the liberty to hold to his own opinion without binding that opinion on others. Our church is not characterized by well-known orators or theologians with wide followings. Rather, we believe the genius of the church is the individual Christian serving Christ in his local congregation in his own community. We strongly believe in the proper and adequate preparation for the Christian ministry, but we do not believe that there should be any distinction between the paid minister and those whose Christian service is volunteer. We believe and put into practice the priesthood of the believer. 
A notable member of our movement who believed in serving Christ where he was was James A. Garfield, a preaching elder in the church. When he became president of the United States, he let nothing stand in the way of his devotion to Christ. Once when asked why he had refused to schedule an important meeting of state on a Sunday morning, he replied that he had a standing appointment for that time around the Lord's table. And on another occasion when questioned about his beliefs, he gave this clear statement about the Christian church. We call ourselves Christians or disciples. We believe in God the Father. We believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God and our Savior. We regard the divinity of Christ as the fundamental truth of the Christian system. We believe in the Holy Spirit, both as to His agency in conversion and as dweller in the heart of Christians. We accept the Old and New Testaments as the inspired Word of God. We believe in the future punishment of the wicked and the future reward of the righteous. We believe that the Deity is a prayer hearing and a prayer answering God. We observe the institution of the Lord's Supper on every Lord's Day. To this table we neither invite nor debar. We say it is the Lord's table for all the Lord's children. We plead for